Podcast One, Red Hook speaking. We're 1.5 below. Stand by, two times, boys. We're looking at 10.5 and 42. Welcome back, podcast fans. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to have your company. We're back with another pod. Uh, this one is part two. If you've not listened to part one of Ian's chat with me, then please do think about heading back to catch that episode first. It was really lovely to catch up with Ian. As we've said previously, we recorded our chat a few weeks before the whole world went into pandemic lockdown but we thought it was important to keep pushing out the podcast. I do hope you enjoyed listening to Ian in part one, much of which was about his early days of sailing and his Olympic campaigns. Wherever you are, as these unprecedented events keep many of us at home, I hope that we're giving you something to listen to and in some way help keep your spirits up during what is for many a difficult time. We do both, of course, talk about Ian's closest friend and teammate, the wonderful Andrew Simpson, Bart to all of us. It's hard at times, it's a terribly sad story, but it's also important. It's important that we all remember what a funny, caring, selfless man Bart was. I think we both got a little upset at one stage, but we also shared a few laughs and of course, we talked about the amazing work done to continue Bart's love of sailing in the Andrew Simpson Foundation. We pick things up with Ian just after he'd moved from the relative disappointment of a silver medal at the London Olympics out to the world of the 34th America's Cup in San Francisco. I hope you enjoy the time I spent with Ian Percy. Fundamentally, it was a thing that lost them. The America's Cup was their press release. How are we going to get better today? That was their attitude, and bang, every day was like that. It does come at a cost that seems completely unjustifiable for sport when you're close to it. Ian, we're talking about your America's Cup journey. It started off with the Italian Plus 39 Challenge, a bit of time with the British Team Origin project but you then moved to the Swedish team, funded by Torbjörn Tornquist, of course, Team Artemis Racing. You were the match race world champion at the time, I think. Great timing. But how did all that come about with Torbjörn? Yep, he, well, he, so he was, sailed, um, was sailing in Swan 45s up in Sweden and stuff, and, and then met Russell, and then through Russell would sell the RC44. Um, obviously successful in business, and the cup was something that just like me growing up he saw was something incredibly special and he had an opportunity to to form a team which is you know it's, it's not something many of us are ever going to have that 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 honor to do but i think for him it, he really understood that history of sport and found it an honor and a really exciting challenge an irresistible challenge to understand how to put the matrix together and one thing i will absolutely stress is the most important person in any team is the first and the first is the owner and so it can go right or wrong from from you know the center from p1 and it, and it went right with Torben. but it it's um how did you learn that well you realize when you're in p2 that it, what you do in p3 4 5 makes a big difference and so you realize it's even more important making that first decision or first couple of decisions and the first couple of decisions is by the owner and then so that has this kind of fundamental effect on the overall result you go back to Alinghi hiring Russell and Brad you know that was you know it comes has filters down of knowledge there's all, always decisions and crossroads along the way and the guidance of an owner can be really helpful then too because their experience often from business or from sailing can be helpful but their biggest effect is that they make the primary decisions that everything filters down from and so um how did you end up with artemis so i was sailing with origin uh, with ben and we we had a brilliant um, few years um, getting ready to campaign for that cup um, we did the match race circuit. Some of the best sailing I did was with Ben, myself, Cat Flap, and Christian Camp. Cat Flap's Matt Cornwall. People will see them on the Sail GP 
commentating, but um, the four of us did the world match race circuit and were really dominant for a couple of years. So we, we were getting good at the match racing thing, our little group. Um, yeah, Ben's not a bad helm to have, to be fair to him. Um, <laughs> carried us around. Good crew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was down to the crew. Um, but then Origin stopped because Origin, uh, which is funny, we're in the Royal Thames here, but Origin was from the Royal Thames, but they, um, that stopped when it switched to Catamarans because Keith and Charles didn't, didn't believe that, you know, they, they could see that Catamaran was going to be a whole different challenge. Um, and, and it proved to be uh, challenging in good and bad ways, really, um, that first cup in San Fran. So they didn't do it and we didn't do it with them. So I was suddenly available. I was tactician, match race world champion. And so I became the tactician for um, Artemis for that cup. Um, and uh, yeah, that was another great experience, learning experience um, that obviously dominated in my mind by what happened to Bart and what happened to us on, on as a team. We'll get to that in a second. But you know, one of my first, one of the first podcast recordings that we did was with Nathan Outridge. And I remember asking him how he ended up joining Team Artemis for that cup. His answer was actually quite funny. He said he loved the, the whole team makeup, the vibe, I guess, of the team. So went with you guys, although he was in demand elsewhere only to realise when he finally arrived in San Francisco that perhaps he should have asked if you were making a foiling AC-72. I mean, what was it like being involved in those crazy big Malta hulls, you know, the 72-foot cup boats? Probably wasn't as scary as it should have been. I mean, I don't think you realise things are dangerous and scary until too late. I think the it was it was fun from a... It, you know, this was a totally new thing that everyone was learning. That was cool. You know, like the speed of learning was huge. I mean, people will remember the speed of learning in the final itself was you know, dramatic. They went about t 10 knots faster from the first race to the last race in the same boat. So some sailing maybe does matter a little bit. Um, so, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, bringing in Nathan was a big move for us. It was, I was kind of, I was a big supporter of that because I knew that these boats, however big they were, were dinghies in the way they behaved. And... Um, he's obviously incredibly skillful and it just won the gold in the 49er with Ian Jensen. So, no, it was, it was, it was you know, it's hard for me to think of it as good times because of what happened. But when I, you know, for sure it was very interesting. The technology has developed now to a point where it's interesting, it's safer, but it's also interesting. And um, so, yeah, for, for sure they were a huge beast. I mean, San Fran was just a pretty intimidating place too. Anyone who sailed there and you, you go out under the bridge and you think it's a lovely sunny day and then it starts to build from five knots to 20 knots in about 10 minutes is never, and the, and the fog comes in and you start going, drops by 10 degrees in temperature. It's a pretty intimidating place to be in a starboat, let alone in a 72 foot catamaran. So yeah, look, it was, it, I'm never going to remember it fondly, but for sure, technologically, it was, you know, incredibly steep. What was the landscape then? I mean, it seems weird now to think that originally just one team, the Kiwis, were building a, a foiling AC-72. Am I right that the Oracle got wind of it? I mean, when did you know that this was becoming a, a foiling arms race? Earlier than we did something about it. I mean, it was... It was, they did quite a good job, the Kiwis, of doing a lot of their validation of their dynamic models that had kind of concluded that. You needed to ask the right questions of your tools to conclude it was faster. It seems silly to say that now because it's so obviously faster, but believe it or not, it was still a debate for a while. You had, obviously, because people didn't all do it and you had to, you know, most people didn't do it, so it wasn't that obvious. But they, so they did a good job of doing it quite secretly on the on a lake. Got to quite a developed um, level of knowledge. I think then, you know, crucially, they made the mistake then of advertising the fact. I think, you know, I, they obviously had commercial pressures, I guess, to, um, which is perfectly understandable to say, look, we're in. This is amazing what we're doing, and this could because it drives money, and money needs is needed to keep it going. But you know, fundamentally, it was a thing that lost them. The America's Cup was their, um, was their, their hand was early. their press release with yeah. with 
Grant talking about going 40 knots steady over the bay on a windy day. And, and I remember clearly thinking that that was, at the time, that that was very costly for them to have done that. Because us, because within our team, I knew the response that did it within our team, which was we had never done over 36 knots. So, and to know that it was holding steady above 40 took it did away with any of the real, I mean, the arguments continued, believe it or not, but they shouldn't have done at that point. And certainly in a large wave of our team knew it become an arms race for foiling. And there was a good period to go by then. You know, we were eight, nine months out, maybe even more. Maybe Oracle were onto already because they'd had a, had a better spy program, but the truth of it is, within Artemis, the majority of the team knew it was a foiling arm race from that video going out. And so it shows you the power of, um, or the costs of needing to promote teams, you know, because that's needed too. I mean, you can't blame them for doing that. That was paying their bills, but it cost them ultimately. I mean, I know, Ian, that you have a real kind of engineering brain. You understand. You have a real grasp of the science and, and the mechanics involved. What was that time like? I remember you saying once that you know, it felt like every day we were going to the moon and back. I don't know if the, I, I don't know if it was, ex that was, was a it cheesy exciting. Line, wasn't it? <laughs> or I think you said it, yeah. I, I mean, it, was it exciting? Was it stressful? Was it just all really just unknown? As I say, I mean, my memories are clouded badly by it because you're right, you remind me of the fact that for me, I, all the things I've said I've enjoyed through my Olympic sailing and I know I enjoy now, it was like that on steroids for that eight month period. So for sure, it would, uh, you know, and probably the one person who won't tell you what an amazing, you know, what an amazing period it was. But yeah, the, 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 the speed of learning was huge. It was, there was, there was fundamental things that went on there. There was the the foiling, there was the um, creating right, active riding moment from the top of the wings, which again, as soon as you check and ask the question of the tools, it's clearly faster, but if you don't ask the question, you don't do it. And, and then uh, that was a, a massive gain too in a strong wind venue. So yeah, all those things. The, what I love about our sport is having these sparks, testing it through the computational tools, checking that it's faster, going out and validating that it was that whole process, which is often a period of between an hour and four months, depending on the lead part, lead time on your, on your part, is, is really, really satisfying. Um, because it's a circular thing, because the being on the water, learning about that particular aspect, working, matching your tools feeds back, and next time you have more knowledge, so your computational tools and your on-water data is feeding and then that process gets more and more efficient. So it's satisfying from a global sense and it's satisfying from that idea coming to fruition or not. And that process, yeah, was going fast for everyone in that time. So it was, it, it was, it was really uh, groundbreaking. Of course, Ian, it was also the hardest of times. You joined the team and wanted Bart involved, your mate. And I guess both struggling a little, perhaps after not winning gold in London. So he came over to join you at Artemis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was natural for me. We, we, we the, the, like along with uh, Nathan and Ian Jensen. I think Bart coming. Those three were quite. I mean, I had only been there a few months by that when by them because I came straight after the Olympics because I was signed up to go and I went straight after the Olympics and they all came around the new year, um, and you know, huge energy that was brought from that attitude that that all three of them had, which was, you know, how are we going to get better today? That was their attitude. And bang, every day was like that. Driving energy around. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's such a key part of it that comes, that does often come from those kind of winners. Uh, and so, it, you know, it was great to have him around. He, he took on his particular jobs, which was understanding the venue, the rules, the strategy, but he, and, and he was trimming a lot and he was sailing obviously very well, like he does. Um, but I think for all three of them, the biggest thing they added was just raw energy as another person who woke up to try and solve problems, get faster and do better. That um, was brilliant having them around. Looking back at that day, Ian, many of us will never forget hearing the news, I know. But of course, out in San Francisco Bay, the boat, your AC-72, broke up and Bart tragically lost his life. How do you think that's affected you, Ian? Well, I mean, very fundamentally, yeah. yeah I mean, and all, and all, all bad. 
Um, but I mean, I don't need, it's funny because you never, I've never been asked that question because you never really think about that. You think about how does it affect his family and him, you know, you always think about him, of course, over things that he's not been part of since is what I always think about. But yeah, if you ask me that question, because I guess we're doing the interview, <laughs> Yeah, badly. It was awful, and it, it it won't ever go away. It's um, it's just no upside. I hate it. I hate things where you like. I love challenges. I love solving problems and making you know trying to make a boat faster or trying to make something work or people get on better or whatever the thing the challenge. I love this is kind of the challenge you can never win, uh, and uh, and that's horribly frustrating it's just sad because i just loved him being around and he's not and it's just shit there's no upside so yeah it didn't it hasn't affected me well um it's uh certainly made me a different person it's made me not as um jovial and i don't necessarily i i, I ran to seriousness and harder work um i haven't run away from that i haven't gone away from that i've gone to a place where my job is to be dependable, deal with problems, and be um, stoic about it. Maybe, maybe I always would have become that boring bloke anyway. I don't know, um, but I'm certainly aware that I've done that. I don't like that in myself anymore. But it's uh, it was it was a two three years where I didn't want to do anything else but that. So then that's what you become that's what you become of it. Um, I need to. Uh, get back to the times when me and Bart were having a laugh, you know, and, and, and loving life and remember that because it's, yeah, two of us don't, uh, yeah. So yeah, hasn't affected me well in, in any way is the bottom line, um, but there's people who have suffered more than me. We often skirt around it and I'm forever asking interviewees about, you know, how exciting a time the past decade has been, the foiling revolution and all of that but it's been at a cost and I can't help but think that back then that sudden jump in speeds in the engineering demands we're all getting ahead of ourselves yes yeah, it always comes down to pure practical things I mean we you know with the offshore boats now we're using load cases that you know, we're still not at a point even now I mean maybe the, this time around we're getting closer but we're not generating dynamic load cases from really developed simulator type models where we're throwing things around seaways, generating real constant load case feedback. We're still generating structural load cases from experience. And when you do something you've never done before, you haven't got experience. So that's danger. That was, you know, and speed was one of the things we'd never done before. And as you say, the loads, the way the boats were sailing, it's just unknowns. And you basing it on therefore no sample size of good data so yeah it was a risk and it and it was a risk that paid terrible terrible price for Andrew and his family and his friends and so of course I will never see it's worth it but the technology is still you know it's not the technology's fault I mean the technology is still very impressive it drops drag of waterborne vessels by up to 90 percent I mean it's quite effective the hydrofoiling thing um, but it's but I think, I mean, I think we would be wrong to think that foiling, I mean, the boat that, brought the, that Bart died on wasn't foiling. It had no active control of lift. It had no active way to um, uh, either suck on the stern or lift on the bow. And so that ironically was foiling has added a lot of safety to fast catamarans, not dropped it away. It's changed load cases and so they break up in different ways and that in itself is dangerous but it actively, the whole no stuff or acts, a, aspect has been greatly increased the safety having foils on the boat or having active control. And then electronic I improvements of actuation and control system censoring has made that safer again. Um, you know, if the Wright brothers tried to go out in a Boeing Dreamliner day one without any sensing, they'd probably wipe it out. But and kind of what we were doing a bit too much. But the truth of it is eventually planes aren't dropping out of the sky so it, it is fine and it is safe and but yeah sport push sports the vehicle to push the limits it was pushing the limits in cars in the 70s in formula one and um and uh it, it, it does come at a cost that seems completely unjustifiable for sport when you're close to it 
um, but we, you know, people keep on doing it. We all keep on doing it, and people keep on watching it. So I guess, yeah, I guess, at some level, it's not unjustifiable, but it will always feel it to me. I sometimes wonder, Ian, how you had the strength to carry on after Bart's death. But as I know from many, many conversations I've had since, you really stepped up at that time. There was this big cup team. They just lost a, a real personality from amongst their ranks. And it was you, wasn't it, that stepped up. You took that on and solidified that team around a love of their missing friend. Yeah, but it, not, not don't put it as an achievement. It was because it was, it was, it was on me to do it because he was my friend. And it, I, I chose to not say no to that and walk away. True, but it was because the decision of what we did next was always had to be right for Bart and future and, 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 and not right for Bart would have been going and someone else getting hurt clearly because that would have been the most terrible thing so that was one end of it and the other was not right for Bart was 100 people going home something finishing losing their jobs and everything ending so they were the two choices it seemed to me at that point and so and the answer to who made that decision was falling with me, not through some achievement from me. It was falling to me because people felt it was respectful to Bart's best friend to be making that call. Um, so we, 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 we obviously made that collectively as a group trying to decide what we felt we wanted out of the next period running up into the cup. What did we feel we needed to do? What did we definitely need to avoid doing? and decided we just wanted to make it around the race course and Torbjorn wanted to make it around the race course too and was willing to support that which was really significant um, and you know maybe more importantly everyone that knew Bart was willing to and wanted to so yeah I, I, I kind of had a part to play because of my friendship with Bart no more everyone collectively had to make their own decisions whether they wanted to get back on the boat We'll talk about the legacy that Bart left in a little bit. But I wonder, Ian, what did you think when you watched that final cup match unfold? I mean, thinking back, you'd grown up sailing dinghies like we all had. You'd won the Olympic medals sailing at maybe 12 knots at best. And in San Francisco, we saw these giant AC-72s going head to head at speeds we could only have imagined. What did you think watching all of that unfold? Um, yeah, like everyone, I was finding it exciting as a sporting spectacle. I was seeing Ben most nights for a beer and debrief, and I was there, um, you know, it, at the venue every day watching the racing. So I was already just seeing it, you know, I wanted Ben to win, so I was just trying to help, and I was trying to analyse and tell him what I thought and, and, and input. Don't get me wrong, I made, I'm sure I had no effect. He was humouring me, I'm sure, but it, it, what I mean is it, it was a technical exchange and interest to see it go but you know you could undoubtedly see that our sport had opened up to new audiences you could see it in the crowds in San Francisco you could see it on the free-to-air TV that was out there showing everyone around the world on YouTube which was a new thing which suddenly didn't sound rubbish anymore I mean the things it did for YouTube in my mind for our community so you know it had transformed sailing and the vision that you know, Larry and Russell had had for me um, had been had been validated in the sentence. The vision was right. Obviously, the I still thought about Bart and that it would never be a price worth paying. But you can't. The vision was something that I believe has been good for our sport personally, um, <coughs> because it excited a lot of people. I think we've we've squandered that but in, not fully at all not fully but in a lot of ways but that's not the fault of foiling catamarans and close racing and I think for, I mean on a technical level the biggest game changer was that the manoeuvres became so much faster that traditionally us you know knowing tornado catamarans thought that they the match racing would always be rubbish because they take so long to turn but actually suddenly be, when it's a foiling catamaran the ability to turn fast with low drag means that the racing was excellent and then you thought wow we've got a really cool product here 
Staying with the cup, uh, Oracle One in San Francisco, they kept the foiling multi-hull concept alive and everyone uprooted to Bermuda. You stayed with Artemis, you had Nathan and, and Goobs, Ian Jensen on the boat, good young talent, a healthy budget, the team looked like a real contender and running the whole thing was Ian Percy. How exciting was that cup in Bermuda? Yeah, I mean, great. I mean, we had just a fantastic team. Um, it was a great atmosphere. Um, I'd learned a lot from people over the years, the likes of Brad and Simmer, and I'd learned that the importance of creating that family atmosphere and the rewards from that. You know, a line that Grant told me once that ten percent of the budget will be spent on HR and families, but it'll be the best ten percent you ever spend, and that always stuck with me. And it's so true. If you if you have a group, it comes back to what I learned early as well with the Olympic stuff. There was many people doing things for voluntarily in the Olympic stuff. We were doing it voluntarily in the Olympic stuff, and everyone put in absolute huge shifts every single time. You realize that people do things for a sense of family and community and a desire to do something together that's special. They don't do it for money. So once you've sorted out a contract with someone, that's done. That is now going to have a very small influence on the motivation for the next three years. It's going to be about a sense of respect and the things we talked about from Sydney where people like to work together because they have mutual respect and they actually valued the opinion of others um, and a sense of that you, that you are respected too and everyone feeling that so we created that environment I believe or you know the group created that environment and it was a really really fun place to be I mean we, we you know we we had a big mountain to climb um, we yeah, you're right, we had a healthy budget, but we certainly were, um, you know, there was only one team really there that didn't have a healthy budget, and of the others, we were at the lower end, but not not through, not through lack of resource. I mean, Torbjorn was great, but it was just, that was where we felt we were. We were very unmanagement heavy. One of the things Torbjorn told me when we started that campaign, you know, I was desperately trying to get the likes of Grant or Ian Murray in to run it um, and it ev and he kept saying to me I don't want managers I just want uh, all of the people that you think that will make us faster in a room and you'll work it out between you and he kept saying that to me and I kept saying yeah but they know what you know come on come on, come on. and we had a few lunches and breakfasts with Grant and Ian and stuff and Torbjorn but and he, he, and he it, had confidence in you yeah. he had confidence in me but he it was you know I get it's true, but he was more that he believed that not adding layers of management between decision makers was very, very important. And, it's, and um, yeah, it burnt the likes of me and Dave Endine pretty hard. But I think the up who was who was running it alongside me. But I think the upside of of his input is definitely true. You know, you you cut layers out between people. You have. Nathan talking to the head of simulation, talking to the mechanical designer, you keeping it tight and small has a lot of benefit. And he banged that drum to me really, really hard. And, you know, he kind of vetoed me bringing in management and just kept saying, no, no, you'll be all right. Just run with it, run with it. And it was, you know, it did create, and, and you know, I see that in Team New Zealand too. There's no doubt, you know, uh, if you kind of call Grant, Torbjorn, he, you know, he would probably not like me saying that, but in the sense that he has his fundraising responsibilities and his overall leadership that Torbjorn does well and he was doing well. You've then got a group of, they would know more than me, but I see five to ten tight, getting it, heavily getting it between them. Um, and then an army of people around who trust and respect those people and are trusted and respected back because they're contributing serious long hours. They're doing their job very, very well and they're respected for it. That's what we try to create, you know, no, not, not a shutdown of knowledge between that five to 10 and the rest, but five to 10 who are collaborating very closely on what are we trying to achieve? And then where I work closely with someone called Dave and Dean, who's excellent, then making that happen and real mutual respect between that side is really powerful. I see that, yeah, and I, I see Team New Zealand do that as an example, you know, as the best, as the one that did it better than us, but um, 
we uh that was kind of Torbjorn's vision to be honest that's how he thinks it should be and you know apart from the 15 hour days that me and Dave had to do it and everyone else had to do every single day I'm kind of with him you made it to the challenger final as I've said you were a real contender with hindsight Ian what more could you have done to win the cup I mean getting my excuses in early we started a long way behind and it, they are real things these are real cumulative um, increases in knowledge particularly nowadays everything that you um, everything that you know is held or should be if you're working efficiently is held in your way of assessing things so if you realize that spray drag on the hull is very important that should be somehow captured in your assessment tools or your computational tools so when you're trying to def choose a new dagger board spray of the on the hull is taken into account it's not some distant memory it is logged computationally that that is now an input into your mold so accumulating knowledge and that knowledge can be about a boat but it's generally not just about a boat it's about these things aren't as simple as that f you know real life example i gave there it's often how you interpret how you make assumptions between the fidelity of a problem and the accuracy of it and making those decisions you know, Team New Zealand have done that well, had done that well, because that is a new way of thinking. I mean, the old way of thinking when I look around the models here is design a boat and decide if it's faster by, well, back in the day, just guess if it's faster and then slowly some ways to assess that. But doing it in this real joined up looped way is really quite new, as in 10, 15 years. And Team New Zealand have been doing it well for 10, 15 years. They brought that in from Formula One with Dan Bellasconi and the like and, and, and really embraced that concept so you you start a long way behind when you don't have those computational models and tools and and you can you know they're hard to buy in because your computational tools are an expression of your collective knowledge and it's your collective knowledge and collective knowledge stops when it stops when the team stops and one of the problems that um, one of the funny things about the America's Cup that's made it somehow with the exception of Team New Zealand, slightly dysfunctional and, and a little bit less technically satisfying is the stop-start nature of it means you lose everyone. And when you lose everyone, unless you're really organised and someone right at the top gets it fully, you lose everything and you start again. And that's why this cup's going to be tough for anyone else. <laughs> but for us then, yeah, we built that up. We learned, we did fast, we, we learned a lot. How could we have done better? A handful of decisions I identify along the way we could have made different calls we if I wanted to summarize we very heavily weighted control um, because of our experience of the need for safety and we therefore and we did not have sufficient capabilities to assess the trade-off between drag and stability uh, no one did but Team New Zealand but we we didn't either and so the trade-off between drag and stability is pretty direct and we always had to be more stable because of our experiences because we started our campaign in San Fran I think had a big influence on that we had a limited number of boards we were going out having that experience on our on that really hideous waterway for us in terms of fear factor so we we and our only measure of stability was was um, uh, very qualitative. It was our opinion, and that was not good enough. And that came because we hadn't had 20 years of, or the previous five years probably, in the case of Team New Zealand, of developing a reasonable way of assessing the trade-off between drag and stability. They had done it. They could make those decisions in a quantitative way. No one else could. We couldn't, but we weren't bold either because we had had a really tough experience too cautious we were too cautious for all the right reasons frankly but um, in the end when you're racing in eight knots nine knots in Bermuda it doesn't feel like it was really worth wait in, in turquoise water and in a 50-foot boat you realize we were too cautious yeah you not only ran the team Ian but you were on it you were you know, part of the sailing team you know how exciting were those AC 50s to race? I mean, what are your memories of, of sailing them at that time? Being on those pedestals, the memory is, you know, Chris Brittle's breath and looking down at the top of the handle. Not this breath's bad, but that was my sole experience, pretty much not. 
it's a very different side of our sport sailing in AC50 in the, when that cup was because it was a grind fest um, I, you know it was back to star sailing very very similar to star or fin sailing you're physically working very hard and you are taking um, very processed breaks to make decisions or help Nathan with decisions basically it's no different to star and fin sailing the different muscle you're using but it's um, so 95% of my experience is pain in the arms lungs and you know being two inches from Chris Brittle's head 5% is making decisions um, about 0% is wow this is fast to be honest because you just don't think that when you're racing but uh, they uh, the time you know there was times in training where you really loved the boats for sure they were beautiful the, the, and, and great that is going on with CLGP because 50 foot size of it just took away that fear factor and it just made you you know that was and it took nothing away from the show in my opinion and so it was now as someone competing in it you were just enjoying the, the technology the speed and not thinking it, it was necessarily that dangerous I mean it's not without risk but it was a big jump I mean it's it's a big difference to go from 72 foot to 50 just because of the heights involved and the falls involved. We were out in Bermuda quite a lot in filming different programmes and we're forever at your base, mostly in the canteen. <laughs> Dee's cooking. Dee's cooking. Uh, if she's listening to the podcast, thank you for looking after us so well. Um, I mean, it was a really lovely environment that you know, you help create. How proud of the team were you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, very much so. I mean, and it's funny, funny to be proud. You, yeah, you word it right. You're proud of the guys because everyone contributes to culture. And it, I tell you, one of the biggest contributors is definitely Bart. What, because when you, one thing that plagues big organisations and teams is bitching and moaning and, and interpersonal battles and no one feels like being childish like that when they've lost someone as great as him so that 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 filtered through and that really helped us all keep perspective um, and I think that's that'll be the case for all Artemis people from AC 34 forevermore that will we'll, we'll struggle to lose perspective I mean things you know for people who knew him less I guess things slowly distance but for me certainly not you can't lose sight of the importance of, it, of of working together and enjoying the good times and not over concentrating on the fact you might have a disagreement about some bearing type, you know, who cares? The thing is we're all trying together to win. So we were helped with that. Um, I was helped by that, some of those comments from the likes of Grant, you know, do spend the money on realizing that the family are making a huge sacrifice. One of the things, and, and you know, I'm lucky my sister is involved, so I, Bryony through her husband Richard Kent and so he was with us and I and so but I've always been kept well aware as you know and Bryony would realize of the downsides on the family as well it's just an unmentioned huge sacrifice people move the whole family to a random place and never see their family never see the husband generally unfortunately but um, of um, because they're at work I say unfortunately in the sense that sexist sport to the extreme I mean but there's never but what it's I mean is, podcast, yeah, another yeah. podcast. But <laughs> I agree. But it's um, it's uh, it's a huge part of it because for those individuals, it's a huge part of it. So we had a lot of family events. We had a lot of parties. We had a playground at our base, you know. And it was really important for me to be able to, if you had to take forty five minutes out for lunch and your family were able to be there, that was the forty five minutes that you're going to see the kids because they're going to go to bed before you're back lightly. So things like that, for me, made a big difference for us. I think it was a really great move to be where we were too. We were based, um, for those who don't know, on a peninsula away from all the other people. It really set that sense of us as a team. It was a beautiful location um, and, uh, and it was a good financial move because we were kindly sponsored there um, by Morgan's Point. So it was a, uh, I was, it, that side of it all worked, but I think the important thing is just never to forget when you're there hammering around deciding some technical decision. So what really matters is the fact that whoever you're sitting across hasn't seen their kids for the last five nights. And if you can make that better, you're going to be much better off as a team because you still have to do the nine o'clock every night. I mean, it, what it can't be is I really can't worry about the family. So we're going to do nine to five because you won't win. So 
it has to be you are going to do seven till nine. So let's just do, given that is a happening, let's do everything we can to make it easier for you and for your family. And then just like that, it was over. You'd been a part of this wonderful team for quite a while by then, and you lost the Challenger final to New Zealand. Obviously, how hard is it then just to walk away from, from the whole thing and, and all those people that had been part of your life for such a long time? Well, short term, it wasn't super hard for me because my first child was due about three days later, which I had something, you know, that most people listening will have experienced to throw my energies into and something really, really huge. But, um, you know, in, 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 the, in, the, in answer to what you meant by the question, the bit hardest thing about being senior in an America's Cup is seeing everything that you've labored and thought about stopping. Um, and it's, it's, it's completely frustrating. It's a zero-sum game. It, compl it really reduces the technical development within our sport because all the things I talked about, you house your knowledge in computational tools. If they walk away, you lose everything. Relationships, how you make decisions, processes for making decisions get lost. Everything stops and, you know, you haven't got very good even in three years because it's only three years. Team New Zealand have got very good in 15, but you haven't got that good in three. You're getting a lot better. You know you're getting a lot better. The team is slowly evolving because you always have things that, and you stop. Now, we didn't stop fully and I mean, that was important. Torbjorn knew that. I mean, he, he saw that too and he didn't lose that and he hasn't lost that, you know, other cup teams beware. He didn't lose that fully because he realized that and he, um, wanted to keep that. You lose people or you lose processes though, so you have lost a lot, but you you have to keep the stuff that's able to stay on a hard drive at least. Um, but very frustrating and I think myself and Dave, who um, who's now with Ineos, but I think myself and Dave, who are still really close, felt felt that hugely, you know, because he, 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 he on making things happen world, uh, you know, and making every, you know, making decisions every single day to to hu build huge boats and buildings and ribs. I mean, Dave, you know, just awesome. But that's all lost as well. And so it is really frustrating. And I just don't want that. Our sport needs, to, Formula One is the other end. They've been rolling. Teams have been rolling for, what, decades. And they're banking gains. And it's not like they don't have step backs and step forward, but they're going forward over time. And now where they can simulate stuff and, and you just can't move it on in a cup cycle to the same degree. You don't get many chances. You, you have about a six, eight months at the beginning where you can work on getting better at making decisions, and then you just have to start using what you've got to make decisions. So cup, Amer uh, Formula One teams have got a team constantly getting better at how you make decisions, and then you've got a race team executing. And so they're much better. And, and that's kind of frustrating for me, because why should we be, uh, you know, we, people in sailing don't get that luxury to have really constantly developing first-class tools. It's Bart's name, it's Andrew. What he achieved in his life and who he was as a person still helps people today. Now I sailed a boat in Bermuda that was going up to four times the speed of the wind. The principle of the physics was very, very impressive. We've got together for this podcast in London Ian, and I know we talked about family a little bit, but you're at a function this evening with your brother, who of course heads up the Andrew Simpson Sailing Foundation. Let's talk about the work the foundation does. I mean, it's been a massive success, hasn't it? What, what was the original goal in setting it all up? Yeah, it was, a, it was, it was funny at first, because of course you don't ever choose or want to be doing foundation in Bart's name so it's a bit of a funny thing when you get together but it was a year later when it originally when it f first formed and I think the goals were slightly different for different people the trustees if you like who formed it I think for me personally it was very much you know I felt really strongly that Bart's name and needed to be out there I was so proud of what he was what he'd achieved so grateful what he'd done for me I wanted him to be in lights I still do, frankly. That's a big part of it for me. Um, and, but you know, you've lost someone very special. You know that, and you're just devastating. But you try to think what his values when you decide what should the foundation do, what should it stand for. 
And so, of course, that took a bit of talking about and thinking about with his close friends and Leah, his wife, who were the trustees. And, you know, things that came through for me was times when I had been away training with him on those ridiculous long days we talked about when I was coming in in the dark, you know, and time felt so very precious. He would still be on the phone talking to some random kid about their woes at sailing. So he, you know, and I, I mean, I would just say what you're doing, but he was just too nice. He just had to help people and had to um, be supportive and people warmed and turned to him. So, um, you know, the demand was high too. So that was clear that some aspect of um, helping people and um, giving people a leg up through giving some attention and was important it felt natural it had to be through sailing i think something we all knew and believed was sailing quite uniquely um can change people um i think we've all felt it that that the 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 getting away from it that you have on the water um that when you have and you, you don't always feel it. Sometimes you're just on the water having a sail, worrying about winning your race. And then other times you're really having a tough time in your life. And sailing is the catalyst that solves it because you get free and you get away. So we knew that too. We knew sailing had this power. Um, so we wanted to investigate that more. And so one small part of the foundation is really studying that and some fantastically interesting studies and results coming out. But the overall thrust was helping young people. So... Uh, through the sport of sailing and trying to concentrate on people that needed a bit of help and so um, it's just incredible numbers of people have been affected and helped you know tens of thousands of people out sailing regularly I think that was something we felt was important through the Andrew Simpson Foundation every single week clubs that have formed are in the centres um, groups of parents from um, who have common challenges be it that, that their children with learning different abilities or um, children who have been expelled with difficult um, upbringings to date coming together and building this cluster like we had back in Stokes Bay with Ben and myself and Bart sailing lasers they're forming on you know lakes around the country and the, and in Weymouth groups of parents and kids having a parents having a coffee kids out sailing and buzzing and turning their life around genuinely through this regular participation in a, in a group. So that side of it, um, I know he would have been so proud of. It's, it's what he did, you know. It's what he did beyond his sailing career anyway and his family life was helping people. And I, I know that firsthand. I saw it firsthand and sometimes to a fault. <laughs> um, he was so, so giving. But the foundation's doing that for him still. And that's really, really special to me and to... Uh, Leah and, and, and Ben and the other people who knew him really closely because it's, ben, it's Bart's name, it's Andrew. What he achieved in his life and who he was as a person still helps people today and will help people for forever, you know. And that's that's what he deserves. That's what he, that's how special he was. And um, that's what makes me happy about the foundation on, um, is that Bart's still making a difference. We were talking earlier and Tim reminded me of something Bart had said just before 2012 of how you'd all been at some big Team GB photo shoot, you know, swimmers, athletes, rowers, cyclists, all of that. And Bart was telling us how he felt like the guy who gate crashes sports photos, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that he was the most unlikely yeah. looking Olympic athlete there. I mean, he didn't just not look like an Olympic athlete, but also I think his mindset as well I mean often Olympic athletes are quite sort of selfish but he was so he was so given wasn't yeah. he? You know, how special a person was he ah uh, yeah exactly his anecdotes like that and yeah how much he did for me as a friend was magic but it, it you know in some ways we all help our friends and it was that thing he would be helping these random people just because he was kind um but it was one of the reasons we have Sailfit as a program, which is an Andrew Simpson program for for kids who um, don't take the sport naturally, they don't eat healthily, they're, they're kind of going on a wrong route physically. Was Bart was used to say to me, you know, if I was if I was being fitness test heavily age sixteen, and that was a criteria for me going on, I would never have been a sailor <laughs> because, you know, his you know he he was having a good time, he was enjoying life, hugely talented, hugely hardworking, but he was not going to say no to the burger. So you know, bad luck, or the beer probably. So, 
Um, you know, so I think he recognised that people didn't always have visible attributes, you know what I mean? Like they could be talented and kind and, and, and hardworking people um, who were worth investing in because I think he felt that he, we, he was lucky that he was still felt but maybe was overlooked at times because he didn't bother going to the gym loads when he was young and so he didn't look and his results therefore did slightly suffer a bit but it wasn't going to affect him in the long run. It was a smart move by him I reckon, he had more laugh. So he, he was always about not judging by appearances and realizing that there's talent in everyone um, and yeah it showed on a lot of genuine levels it's an easy thing to say but I saw him I tell you I saw him do that I saw him give to many people I saw him talk to people in our Olympic team who were, had a bad regatta often you know frankly you kind of avoid people who had a bad regatta because you don't know what to say but Mark always knew what to say you know he would be the one sitting with them talking it through making them think about the next one. He was very much, you know, the father of the Olympic squad in 2012 and even 2008 because he was like a father, giving for the kids, you know, and he, and he still is, as I say. I remember, you know, lost the trials in 2008 for Beijing and, you know, he sent a note and it meant the world. No, he's... Um He's like that. He's like, I didn't know he had done that, you know. But that's there's many, you know. That's what he's like. He's so kind. Like he, you know, he's thinking what you're going through at that moment. And not everyone's like that. Is the bottom line. Not everyone is as kind as him. And yeah, that's, I didn't know. It's another example. It's just that everywhere he touched people by being kind to them and thinking about them. I mean, sometimes having a massive piss up with them too. He touched them there quite well. But he. He, yeah, he, he was always giving. You know, he gave to me and my sailing for, and as a friend for 12 years before getting anything. You know, it was just because that's what he was. And yeah, we, we, the foundation's special for that because he does it. Um, he still does it. And now you're back in the Olympic fold in coaching our qualified NACRA 17 team, and they're doing pretty well. <laughs> Just won the Worlds in Melbourne. I mean, how is that working out, sitting in the coach boat all day? Yeah, you gotta, you got to pick the right people, you see. I'm smart. I learned that over the years. Um, unbelievably rewarding. Absolutely loving it, I must admit. Really loving it. Um, it's like all the good bits without any of the horrible pressure bits at the end. So, uh, I mean, it's... First of all, I can't coach anyone who isn't nice and John and Anna are just the kindest people I know. Ed, John, who I've known a lot longer, was our training partner in 2012 and was really close to me and Bart. I mean, he, he, he put in 15 hour days every day for 18 months for no pay, absolutely to help me and Bart try and get a games. And that, you know, just like Bart did for me in um, Sydney, he did for me and Bart in 2012 in London and so you just don't forget people who are willing to give like that and he has you know he's given to a fault through his life he's been too so nice he would never say no he'd always help people and as we talked about a bit with the Olympic campaigns you have to learn to be quite um, you need to learn to take sometimes and not just give and he gives too much as uh, has done we should oh, say their name John John Gimson John Gimson and Anna, and Anna Barrett. Barrett yeah yes. and 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 hugely talented of course like any Olympian going there but I think um, yeah it's amazing how kindness can hold you back and I've seen that with him and certainly isn't I don't hold back in telling him that now that you and and sometimes the thing I touched on it earlier this belief that getting people to help you is somehow a favor and it of course it is but they're doing it because they want to do it and when I am coaching John and Anna, I'm doing it because I re get a lot of pleasure out of coaching John and Anna and helping them. They're not, I'm not doing them any favour. You know, it's for me too. I love it. And people love it. You know, they've got an army of people working for them, like me and Bart, an army of people working for us, trying to get us to win. And of course, me and Bart were always grateful. But having been now on the other side, I realised that everyone's getting something out of it too in a really positive way like everyone's enjoying it Nick Harrison who coached myself and Andrew free of charge in the star for four years like I am with John A it's fun you know I enjoy it it's, I'm, I'm choosing I am choosing to do it genuinely it's not a it's not a chore so loving it and I you know they uh, they're working hard I mean one thing John 
really took from uh, helping myself and Andrew into 2012 is that every hour in the day is there for a reason. Um, I think the general advice he gets from the OAA is, are you sure you're not burning yourself out? <laughs> but, you know, he gets it. He gets that 15 ads uh, are there to try and help you win a gold medal. And, you know, winning the World Championships there in Geelong is a testimony to that. I mean, they're, they're incredibly knowledgeable on the boat, fast, hardworking. And, you know, they'll have challenges, but you just have to learn how to be better. And they're, they're pushing hard. So, that, that's, you know, I wish them all the luck. I was thinking about you at that final, the final medal race of, of the NACRA Worlds. And I was thinking back also to when Ian Walker coached us, <laughs> it was like he was pacing the room. He'd motor back and forward in the rib nervously, you know, unable to do anything once we crossed the start line. What, what are you like watching it unfold? Well, I had a bit of a hangover that day because we had, like, this is the beauty of coaching, you see. So Ian Murray was there with the Aust leading the Australian team. There's a load of other star sailors this week. And, and, and Mark Pickle, who you all know, who's definitely likes a drink. Anyway, we had a star reunion dinner the night before and one thing led to another. So I'm there thinking, right, morning of the race and I've got a bit of a hangover. And they're like, God, I'm going to let them down. I've got, I've got a hangover. I've got to still say the right thing. How do I say the right thing and not let them know that I'm hungover? And I'm but of course, I walked to Dingy Park and John's like, oh God, you got a hangover. You know, he could see straight through me because he's had a few with me himself. Um, so getting through that was the first challenge. But then, yeah, on the water with them, uh, yeah, I don't think I was necessarily helping. But the good thing is, one thing that, like, I was, because I was so nervous, and, I mean, they then went and delivered. They were brilliant, so I didn't need to feel bad about it. But I think, you know, the coach has got really desperately trying to help, and that can be to a fault. And But the great thing is with John, we know each other really well, and I've always said to him, you've just got a feedback. you got it. Like, you, there is no time to be nice when you're trying to win a gold medal. So, and no one minds you being straight. So, you know, we've talked about, I better just calm down a little bit into the metal race and things like that. So, you know, it, it is nerve wracking, that stuff. Um, and uh, I know I was really determined for him to go out and try and win the Worlds. He went in 17, but it was kind of, it was like deja vu on our Olympics in London. He was 17 odd points behind Nathan and, v and very close to second. And he then turned it around just like Freddie did uh, with Max. But yeah, they went out and sold a brilliant final race, went and just won it, and then things, then it's out of your hands. So I was super proud of them. I mean, this a bit, you know, John has campaigned. He left, he left home at age 16. He lived up north and he was too far from the coast. And at age 16, he got a train down south and lived with a, you know, a sailing family that he knew and sailed every single day from age 16 with a goal of going to the games. And then had the most worst luck, like he campaigned the, tornado he got kicked out he turned pain the star and then that got kicked out and now he's finally now in the nacro and uh you know and um and just found the right cocktail and that is in huge part to anna because this like all these high performance boats 49ers uh nacras it is you know 50 50 is complementing the helm i can tell you because you it's such a physical boat, the, the control system for the ride heights all on the crew, the trimming, the physicality, and she is damn good, damn good. I mean, if I have to, if I have to look, I say to John sometimes, yeah, you're doing all right, but, you know, if you weren't with Anna. Because I can say that because I know it was like that with Bart. I mean, as many times I lined up with Robert Shite and I could say, well, he's probably better than me, but Bart, you're a hell of a lot better than Bruno, so I've probably got this one covered. Sorry, Bruno, you're bloody good to have. Just, that's what I used to say. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, Anna's like that. She's a massive asset, like massively good, very robust, um, and really uh, systematic in her approach. So I think they're a strong team. I mean, there's a lot of strong teams in the NACRA, so I'm not, you know, uh, but, when, and, but just like me into uh, Beijing and London, I just want them to be able to say they've done everything they can when they line up in the first race, and then we just see what happens from there. Oh, it's going to be an exciting summer. I'm so pleased that, you, that you're going to be around. Being back in the Olympic fold, I mean, what's what's your opinion, I guess, uh, of Olympic sailing? Is it is it in good shape? Uh, better than a lot of sailing, I would say. Um, I mean, big picture, yes, probably, um, because the world's getting a little bit richer, and so there's more countries uh, getting to a point where they can sail, and I, I appreciate that. I like our sport being more diverse in its country network. Um, seeing 
other uh, there's more spread of talent across countries which i think is healthy it makes it show that it's about individuals and skill and effort not about a very well you know one funded program or something which maybe me and you benefit from not doing ourselves a benefit there. but the um you know aspects of it i certainly aren't happy about i i really think we're in a right mess with this one design setup thing in that the, to build boats that are truly one design would be make them eye-wateringly expensive and so we've got a natural contradiction between trying to be one design um, and the cost of making something truly even at the highest level being you know millions expensive i mean to make a 49er fleet that was truly exactly the same would be truly millions because that's how it, difficult it is to make things to the level of tolerance that's required and so people are solving it in two ways and they the top people you know fortunately the likes of nathan and pete burling were, uh, were doing america's cups had a good funding and were able to buy lots of boats and try lots of stuff and you know i don't want to take anything away from the fact that i probably think pete and blair would win in any boat i'm just saying that it as a concept it's flawed so I don't like that, and I think that makes it restrictive and not easy to um, for new nations to come in because they don't just come in with a kind of knowledge, skill level deficit. They also come with an equipment knowledge deficit that's hard to solve. And uh, but it's dishonest in the sense that if you did that with the Finn, you had to get out and learn about it or the Europe. And now you just don't know about it because it's all brushed under the carpet. And no, no, we're in a one design class. It's all down to you. Sorry, Mister, coming from you know. Democratic Republic of Congo is not just down to you, but no one's telling you, you know, and that's not great. I know we've talked about it already, but what about the cup, the foiling AC-75s? What do you think about how that is shaping up? A um, well, big picture again, I just, I just wish we didn't change it because I don't care what it is, but if we change it, we really lose momentum as a sport and we um, add huge amounts of costs. We totally turn off new interested people. We turned, talked about being turned on on the, that last final series in San Fran. They maintained their interest and it goes. And the fact that people, you know, we have this, and it's, I'm being contradictory because this mystique of the cup has some elements to it. And one of them is the winner gets to decide the rules. I really think we just need to get over that that is not the primary part of the mystique and stop turning off um, people to our sport by stopping it for three years and you have to stop it if you change the boat um, and then as we know traditionally when you change the boat you also don't have close racing at first it's going to be a lot better than in the well that can be better than it is in the past because of the, some of the technical simulations I've talked about being more generic and known but it will be worse this time because of the particular design of the boat having a very steep um, performance curve to true wind speed and also having very difficult optimal equilibriums to achieve put in layman's language the boats are real fast when they're foiling but they're really slow and really hard to get foiling that doesn't necessarily make for the best racing that said on the positive front i look at the boat and they undoubtedly really cool um so much interesting technology on the details so much things to you know so many amazing things to get your teeth into um, and the teams will be loving that and really enjoying it and um, lucky for them there's still four conglomerates of private public funding uh, to collectively able to make that happen but we've got to get away from that we can't you know let's do this boat again next time you know or whatever and then the next one again and it, longevity brings in and we talk back to Valencia what was it, V5, V5 racing. I mean, it, the, the, it's just, it's written in the wording. It was 14 boats and it was V5. And then we went to San Francisco and however much we can talk about the boats being cool and all the rest of it, it there wasn't right. There was four teams, three, was there? Four teams, yeah, and, that, and there's four teams again. I mean, it's wrong. It's, 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 it's wrong for building people in. It's wrong for making another generation of people in the 80s that I talked about wanting to go sailing because it's not touching as many people. When you only have four teams, it's not touching many people. And it didn't touch anyone for three years now. No one even saw anything. I mean, the only thing they read about the America's Cup was, you know, there wasn't even any intrigue and like fights this time. So there was just nothing for four years. And 
you know, that's not building the next generation of fan. So I'm not blaming anyone. I just it's the, it's the nature of the competition at the moment. But we should get over the fact that that bit of the history is doing us any good. It's not. You know how it works more more than most, Ian. Do you think Ben can win it? Yeah, sure he can. I mean, in sport. Um, I, you know, I talked earlier about Team New Zealand's strength of 25 years, and I think that isn't, you know, that's what I think. I mean, it, it's an advantage to have validated your the way in which you model waves in your computational tools for the last 10 years. And if you haven't got, haven't done that because you haven't had the last 10 years, it's harder to beat someone who has. That's one example of millions that they've built up over 25 years. You couple that. They've got boat builders that have worked with uh, mechanical engineers and structural engineers for years. So when they have problems to solve, they solve them quick and efficiently and they get sailing. They've sailed how many days? I mean, you add everyone else up together and it's probably double that. And they've had a boat on a ship and they've still been out. It's just, I mean, brilliant people, utmost respect for those two New Zealand people, but it, it is a nature of evolution. You get better and they have got better. So I, th I think, and one of the interesting things is that the, the, the strength of Team New Zealand that I've talked about, computational tools, bank knowledge, waves, would be a great example of what I'm about to say, is that you're even better off if you totally change, you throw the deck of cards up into the sky because then you need to be cleverer, you need to be more nimble, you need to have better ways to assess wider areas and then concentrate tighter and optimise tighter areas. New teams are worse off in a new rule, not better off. And that, that was different from the models we see around us, where it was about chucking a bit of luck and the memory of one designer. That was easier for a new team if it was a new rule. It's the opposite now, it's harder. Well, Ian, you'd be pleased to know we've come to the end of the podcast. Final <laughs> question. I think we've asked more questions than we've asked anyone ever before in this podcast. I mean, Apologies, you've, listeners. <laughs> you've crammed a massive amount into your 40-something years. What lies ahead for Ian Percy? Well, I touched on it earlier, how frustrating it is to lose your abilities, your um, working practices, computational tools. And so we didn't want to do that. Torbjorn didn't want to do that. And so we needed to, um, needed to keep that together. But furthermore, if you think back to 2018, there was a real rise of the realization of the challenges um, of climate change. And so there was a, you know, I, we all were touched by that and I was no different. And so trying to, um, you know, I sailed a boat in Bermuda that was going up to four times the speed of the wind without any fossil fuels, without anything. Now we you know, spent some money to get there, but um, the principle of the physics was very, very impressive. and. That was stuff that was learned, five or six key things that were learned and, and practiced and tested. So the key for us was to try, for, for me, was to try not to waste um, all that talent knowledge, but on the contrary, use it for something that I'd be, become passionate about and I knew a lot of people had become passionate about. So Artemis Technologies was something that myself and Torbjorn set up, which was to um, use the technologies from the cup. Now the primary one we all talk about and know is hydrofoiling and rightly so. Hydrofoiling takes a boat, you know, somewhere between, what were the boats in Bermuda, three tons and 150 tons and drops the drag somewhere between 70% and 90%. So off the bat, you're dropping the emissions but somewhere between 70 and 90% of any of boats in that range. So now we've got to get the cost down to make it to a point where we can harness that. But you know, that's just process, that's just time, that's just evolution of ideas, something we've been practicing to do for the last 20 years. So um, that's the mission at the moment. We're coupling a lot with British government. Um, we're working on a program, Strength in Places, which is a, a con consortium of people in Belfast funded by the British government to, to take that technology, some of the knowledge from aerospace, motorsport, America's Cup, to, um, to to harness the technology advancements in those three areas to drop emissions of maritime. So really exciting. And, and I, I get the same buzz, exactly the same buzz, out of finding a 10 kilowatt power saving, i.e. a saving on the emissions 
from a development of a new part for a foiling ferry as I do for a cup and I'll be honest with you it's there's not much difference in pleasure there's, there's no difference in pleasure at this point the events are great the events the competitions are great because they validate it but I've always said to you all the way through this the actual competition celebrations not the point um, so I'm really enjoying that loving that getting to know a lot of people a lot of different areas um, finding the harsh reality of having to pay for things when you know not got an America's Cup uh, budget behind you um, but that's that's correct too because if you if you the if you do an America's Cup campaign you don't produce a sustainable product that changes anything and I went to a I went to a good talk at Cambridge University where our company was based for a while by a Tesla rep it was a pretty hopeless talk but the one good thing I heard from him was he said that Elon Musk had said is you don't change the world if you produce something that no one wants so no one wants something that's a million quid and saves you a little bit of co2 you've got to work on costs you've got to work on efficiencies and finding all that 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 world fascinating and just enjoying the same process of making something better uh, that i have for the last 20 years so that's a good place to end ian percy it's been an absolute pleasure thank, thank you, you. So that's it for this month, podcast listeners. I hope you enjoyed our time with Ian. It's been great to catch up with him. You may remember in part one, I mentioned his slight reluctance at doing the podcast. Quite unbelievably, he didn't think anyone would want to hear what he had to say, but I'm so glad he did. Ian, a massive thank you for being so very generous with your time. If you're sat at home and at a loose end right now, take some time to check out the Andrew Simpson Foundation. They're online at andrewsimpsonfoundation.org. The work they do inspiring young people through sailing is incredible. Check them out. And if you have some aspiring little Ian Percy's, then uh, get them involved. We're not entirely sure what's on the menu for next month's podcast. We, of course, live in the hope that in four weeks' time, the world may be a very different place. We've got a few plans. We'll keep you posted. Until then, please do keep safe. Take this seriously. And I hope you don't need me to tell you how vital it is that we all do our bit to keep the risks of infection at bay. So wherever you are, listen to the authorities. And while necessary, stay at home. Keep in touch. Let us know what you thought of the chat with Ian. If you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating and leave a review and all of that. The podcast is produced as ever by Tim at Vertical Films. Many thanks, Tim, for all your hard work. Until next month, keep well, podcast listeners, and keep safe. Standing by. Out.